that's better okay so um yeah ethiopia east africa is where we're going and i'm going to be honest with you guys today i've chosen ethiopia i didn't even give people a vote this time because ethiopia is gonna happen um one of my favorite countries to talk about and to learn about um because of its culture uh because of its history and i've got a very soft spot for the now deceased emperor Haile selassie so i'm not gonna lie our cultural stuff we're going to get a bit historical we're going to start sort of uh, i'm going to rave for a little bit about emperor Haile selassie just because i love him i do um but it's going to be a, be a while as you know we do the culture last so we're going to start with the physical geography and the shape and the positioning the location of ethiopia then we're going to go and have a look at the wildlife um before we look at the government and uh the, everyone's favorite bits the GDP per capita. Oh yeah, can I get a shout out for the GDP per capita? No, no I can't. Okay, so uh, let's take a look. Where is Ethiopia on our world map? Let's make this nice and big here. So we can see that Ethiopia is down here in the yellow continent or the yellowy continent of Africa. So here's Great Britain here. Uh, so far we've been to Australia down here we've been to brazil we've been to china and then last time of course we visited little old denmark up here um but now we're down into africa into ethiopia so um it's in the east of africa kind of central africa um and it's bordered by lots of other countries too let's see if we can have a look at those so here are ethiopia's neighbors and its capital city which is the finest city in the world to say i mean i i urge you all to join in and say this capital city Addis Ababa it is Addis Ababa is the capital of Ethiopia which is just you know just say it to yourselves have fun with it Addis Ababa it's, it's hugely satisfying um, but the neighbors here we've got Sudan um, South Sudan now uh, Eritrea Djibouti Somalia uh, just over the sea there to Yemen Kenya down in the south and we can just see Uganda, not truly neighboring uh, Ethiopia, but still very close. So it's a country with a lot of neighbors, some of whom we'll mention later. Uh, and the capital city there, Addis Ababa, is a big, bustling, pretty modern city. Um, and it's pretty central to the country, you'll notice. Now, let's bring that one down. Whoa, people still coming in. There we go. Oh no, it's all gone funny. Um, now you'll notice that the backdrop behind me uses the colors um, of Ethiopia, just inverted. Um, but here's the, the flag of Ethiopia. You can see the green, the yellow, the red, and the star in the middle there, uh, the star of Ethiopia. I don't know if it has a special name. I assume it probably does, but I don't know it. Um, so it's a big, bright, colorful flag, uh, a bit more bright and colorful than some of them that we've seen so far. There we are, put that down there. Now, um, <laughs> Jay says it's way better than our flag. It is a very natty flag, it's true. Yes. <laughs> very, very big, bold, and uh, quite African, isn't it? Yeah, I like it. Uh, now, oh, that's a good question. So, a pinch of magic has asked me, what is the main religion of Ethiopia? And to be honest, there's a couple. Well, there's a few, but the main ones are Christianity and Islam. Um, so, and they're pretty equally balanced. Now, we'll talk about this more when we get to the cultural bit but um ethiopia is home to some very very old religion um the emperors or the line of emperors uh, of which Haile selassie was the last they could trace their roots all the way back to solomon and king david in the bible and that's what they believed all the way back to old testament times um it's believed that there's a very ancient jewish community there um, the Christianity that is mainly uh, prominent is a type of Orthodox Christianity, so not Roman Catholic, not Protestant, very different from uh, most of Europe, uh, or at least Western Europe. Um, I don't know if there's any Buddhism. No, I'm, I'm sure there are the odd Buddhist, but then you've got a big uh, Islamic contingent as well. So you'll find plenty of churches and mosques and the odd synagogue, uh, some of the oldest synagogues in the world. Um, uh, down in Ethiopia so it's yeah a very spiritual place a very religious place and those religions they haven't always got on as uh, you know is typical in much of the world but nowadays yeah it's not doing too bad to be fair all right let's start then with our physical geography if I can find where I've put that here we go so let's take a look at the biomes um, 
here we are. Um, all right. So we well, might be familiar with one of these maps. I think we used one of these for Australia to have a look at the different kind of vegetation and climates and uh, the landscapes in a country. And so this one looks really cool. It looks like somebody's gone crazy with a paintbrush, uh, but I'll talk you through it in a second. Um, I'm not sure. Somebody asked why are the flags of countries usually three colours. I don't know. Um, maybe that's just you know. No, it's not always the true. It's not always true. But uh, yeah, uh, they're, they're often three colours. That does seem to be popular, doesn't it? Definitely. <laughs> All right. So let's unpack what kind of uh, climates and biomes we have in Ethiopia. Um, let's first of all let's start with this nice blue colour here. Tropical savanna climates. Now savanna is grasslands. Not many big trees, although there are big trees, um, but we're not talking loads of trees shoved together like in a forest. We're talking wide areas of grassland. So if you think savanna, think the Lion King, uh, that kind of landscape. Short grasses, maybe you know, in the dry season, quite yellowy, but in the green, in the <laughs> wet season, really green and lush. Uh, small bushes everywhere, some trees uh, poking out through the top, but otherwise this. this wide ocean of grasses. Um, oh, I don't know. I don't know, Kyle. Ooh. Mm. Um, oh, can I write Ethiopia? Here we are. Uh, there we are. I'll put it big here. Here we are. I'll put that there. Ooh. I'll put it down here, actually, because it doesn't want to go there, does it? Ethiopia. There we are. That's Ethiopia. Okay. Um, now, if we go over to the east of the country, back from the west, in our red areas here, we've got warm desert climate. So it's actually quite dry. Uh, as we'll see in a minute, the land slopes down. It's high in the west, slopes down towards the east. Um, then we've got warm semi-arid climate. So this is uh, quite desertous, but not quite so deserty as the, the, the full east. We've got a warm Mediterranean climate here, up in the hills. So uh, it's quite high off the ground here, which gives it a nice warm uh, uh, temperature rather than a very, a very hot temperature further down. Because, of course, the higher you go, the cooler it gets. But this is Africa. So down uh, at sea level, it is very hot. Up in the, in the hills and mountains, it gets a bit cooler. Um, we've got uh, more temperate Mediterranean climate here. Here we go. Um, we've got temperate oceanic climate, which is around here. So think Australasia. Uh, that kind of thing, like uh, what would the weather be like down in Australia. We've got humid subtropical and we've got humid subtropical climate with subtropical oceanic highland climate mm, mixed together. So basically these are the nice, uh, nicest uh, weather areas. A bit hot down here, um, uh, but in this, in this central region it's uh, nice and warm but not too extreme, yeah. Oh, baobab trees. Yes, I believe they, they do have baobab trees. Yes, that would make sense because baobab trees are very uh, common all across the African savannah. See, that would make sense. Um, uh, <laughs> yellow and green does look like a bird. And in fact, there are parrots. I haven't got a picture of parrots. Uh, a pinch of magic gas. Are there any volcanoes? Not that I know of. I don't believe that Ethiopia is on a tectonic uh, uh, plate boundary. But I might be wrong. I don't know. I haven't looked into it. So... But as far as I know, it has not. No. Um, okay. So let's take a look now at Ethiopia in terms of its relief. So I mentioned the high ground, the low ground. If we use this map here, we can see that the ground is very high all along the sort of center of the country here. Um, on these maps, if we remember, um, does Ethiopia have oil? Not as far as I know, Travis. Good question. But I don't think so. Um, I mean, it may have small amounts, but I don't. It's not famous for its oil production like uh, Middle Eastern countries or anything. Um, uh, ah, now there's a good question. Uh, uh, we'll come to that in a second, Eleanor. We'll see if we can work that out. But um, our relief here: the more green it is, the lower it is. So, as you can see, in the uh, east of the country, we've got very low land uh, rising into this yellow colour, which is a bit higher, and that's the hottest place. So we can kind of think of flat, low, desertous areas there. Um, uh, the 
more yellow it gets into brown and then eventually to purple that tells us how high uh, the land is so it's getting higher and higher so you'll see that the highest points of, Af uh, of Ethiopia are the coolest parts where the, where the weather is just nice and temperate uh, a nice Mediterranean climate up there in the highland rather than very hot around the edges. Mm -hmm. Um, now, someone's asked, where is Addis Ababa? So we'll see if we can work this out. If I, uh, if I find us our map of Addis Ababa here, if we steal this one for a second. Here we go. And we bring it. What color is Everest? Everest, uh, that's a good question. So on this map, if there were Everest, it would be a very, very deep purple for sure. So what we can do is we can put our maps together and we can try and work out what climate area Addis Ababa is in. So we'll notice that Addis Ababa is pretty much central. Yeah, maybe a little bit further west than east if we take, if we can take into consideration our point here. So Addis Ababa is about, hmm, yes, I think it must be about there in this blue area, the tropical savanna climate, I think fits it best. So it's highland, but it's warm. Yeah, nice, warm and high. Hmm. Um, can people walk on these hills? Yes, yes, uh, yes. So we're not talking mighty mountains, or at least not so many. Um, uh, but uh, people, yeah, can walk around there and they can live in the hills and mountains. Yes, for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, ooh. Uh, Kyle is saying you can find wild melons in the savannah lands. I, I know that that's true along North Africa. I don't know how true that is of Ethiopia. Uh, the capital of Ethiopia, Henry, is Addis Ababa. So you can see that written here. A-double-D-I-S-A-B-A-B-A. -A -A -A. Addis Ababa. Ooh, it's so fun to say. <laughs> um, okay, so Ethiopia then made up of all these different biomes, these different climate types, warm in some places, cooler in others, um, but everywhere is pretty, pretty nice weather, let's say. Um, this gives Ethiopia a good uh, position in the world because although, as we'll see, Ethiopia is not a particularly rich uh, country, it does have some good fertile land. Um, uh, sadly, the east is not as fertile as the west, but still, most of, of Ethiopia can uh, grow food. There was a very famous famine in the 1980s in Ethiopia where you know, the food did go short and for various reasons, including poor weather, but also very bad um, governance by the ruling classes of Ethiopia at that time. A lot of people did die of starvation. But that isn't a... Uh, that isn't a common thing, you know. Ethiopia isn't always being hit by famines and people aren't always dying. Um, but in the past, it has happened. Mm. Mm. Kyle tells me that it's quite a good place for archaeological finds. I couldn't believe that because, as I said, there are some very ancient cultures. People have been living in Ethiopia um, for thousands of years. We're talking, you know, 3,000 years. And just to give you an idea, um, people who believe in the Ark of the Covenant, um, this great big chest of gold that held the Ten Commandments of Moses. So we're talking, you know, 3,000 years old, possibly longer. Uh, there's a common belief that that was taken to Ethiopia and it was put into a, a, a synagogue there. Um, but it's completely missing. So there are plenty of treasure hunters and uh, people like Indiana Jones who go out to Ethiopia looking for relics from the past. Um, no one has found the Ark of the Covenant yet. Um, but maybe one day, maybe they will. Uh, maybe it's hiding there. Maybe the people of Ethiopia know exactly where that great big metal box is uh, and they're just not telling. Ooh, mysterious. Mm. So... Um, Let's take a look at some wildlife. If we've got all these different uh, climates going on, we're going to have a whole load of different li uh, animals. So let's zoom in here a bit. Here we go. So we're going to start here with the national animal of Ethiopia, which is the black lion. Now, this lion is called the black lion, not because it's completely black, as you can see, but it has quite a black mane. And these lions, this particular species or uh, breed of lions, I don't know, Hmm. This particular type of lion is only found in Ethiopia. Um, so you'll notice it's pretty much the same as every other lion, but with its wonderful black mane going on there. So that's the black lion, and that is the, the animal of Ethiopia, hence my lion in the background here. 
Um, uh, Musa and Issa, they ask, what is Ethiopia famous for? Well, by the end, uh, I'll definitely give you a few ideas. When we get to the cultural bit, you'll see what Ethiopia is famous for. A few things that Ethiopia is famous for. Okay, moving along. Uh, here's another animal which is only found in Ethiopia, a Galelda, I think it's a Galel, Galeda, maybe? A Galeda baboon. And you can see this sort of fits with, with the, uh, the trend of Ethiopian animals that I've chosen for today. They all have particularly cool hair. Um, our baboon here is very similar to other balloons, just a little bit more hairy, and it's got this really cool sort of red uh, area on its neck and chest um, unlike many other balloons that you'll find uh, balloons baboons that you will find in other parts of Africa I really like these I would like to to stroke and cuddle one of these things it looks proper soft doesn't it um, uh, yes Kyle Somali wild donkeys can be found there um, I didn't choose those though but um, yes they can be yes uh, you can find wild donkeys in Ethiopia too <laughs> <laughs> Timothy says, I said balloons twice. I'm sorry. Baboon? Balloon? They're very similar. Here's another animal, which I believe you don't find anywhere other than Ethiopia. Um, and, oh, hang on. A menlik bushbuck. Here we are. A small member of the deer family, you can tell because of its horns. But I like its style, you know, it's got all these cool stripes and dots on it. It's got these nice little white flecks on its nose. Again, you know, it's just showing that Ethiopia. It's all about getting the hair right, you know? Um, oh, MB Shadow Girls tell me there are volcanoes in Ethiopia. Cool. Excellent. Yes, I hadn't researched volcanoes in Ethiopia, so now I'm, I'm happy that there are some. Ah. Uh, Kyle is also telling me there are Walia Ibex. There are, but I, again, I haven't chosen those. I thought too many species of deer-type creature might get a bit dull. Here we have one of my favorite creatures with hairstyles. Again, another animal only found in Ethiopia, the Bale Mountain Verret, a type of monkey with this really cool kind of white beard and this excellent, it's almost an afro, it's kind of like a, a blondy, uh, light colored afro style. I really like it. Um, Oh, Nadia's asking, wouldn't hairy animals get too hot? I, I suppose having a hairy coat would be uh, a difficulty, but these animals have adapted to their climates. So um, I doubt they have the same kind of fur as like a polar bear or something that is designed for... Uh, here we go. Excuse me a second. That is designed for cold weather. This would be... Um, a kind of fur that's you know adapted to its environment, I guess. Oh, sorry, what was the deer called? Let me go back to the deer. Here we are. This is the Menlik bushbuck. And there were, when I was researching Ethiopian animals, there were lots of different species of uh, gazelle and uh, deer type creatures. Um, so I chose this one because I thought its hairstyle was the best, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, Kyle. <laughs> um, are there any animals endangered in Ethiopia? Now, that's a good question, Rakia. I'm not sure if they are if they are on the endangered list, but I, you know, all of these animals can only be found in small groups within uh, within Ethiopia. So maybe maybe some of them do count as endangered and others don't. Yeah. Uh, oh, the country we're looking at today is Ethiopia. There you are. All right, here's another one. This is a mountain Nyala. Um, I like this one. Again, it's got those wonderful uh, white streaks across its nose there, looking really cool. And these amazing curly horns and these excellent kind of stripes and spots. It's got everything, you know, this one. Uh, and it's got its nice shaggy beard. So I do like uh, an animal with a good haircut. It's even got a mane across its back. Look, yeah, definitely gone to the barbers, this one. Hmm. Um, and finally, we'll take a look. Oh, no, hang on. There's one more before we get there. Now, uh, this one is another species only found in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian wolf. Oh, here we are. Uh, you can see it there. Kind of this, it's not quite as big, maybe, as some northern wolves. Um, it's a little bit more streamlined, a more reddy brown colour. Yeah. Um, and then over here, here we've got... Uh, a pair of leopards. Now, I've mentioned this guy before, Haile Selassie. I'm going to mention him a lot today because I absolutely love him. Um, but Haile Selassie, he was the emperor of Ethiopia and he was famous, amongst other things, for having a lots of interesting wild pets. Here he is with his two pet cheetahs. Um, you know, as you do, 
if you're the emperor, you may as well have some cheetahs, I suppose. Um, so he would keep lots of animals, uh, mainly African animals from all across Africa. So I don't know how, how many of these you find in the wilds of Ethiopia, but Haile Selassie, he had a couple of pet ones. Oh, no, people are saying it's mean. I think he treated his animals pretty well. Yeah, I think he did. Um, uh, Yes, he was very rich. They they had very nice big uh, areas to roam in, I believe. Yeah, um, there you go. <laughs> uh, right, so there's our animals. We've got our wolf there. We've got our deery things. We've got our monkeys. So as you can see, you know, I, I chose here animals that really are special to Ethiopia, but you can also think of a lot of other African animals that you would find there. I think there's a quite a lot of camels roaming around in Ethiopia too. Uh, right. ooh, ooh, ooh. There we go. All right, let's take a look at the human side. Let's take a look at the government. So this here is Abi Ahmed, who is the prime minister of Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia is a democracy, so people vote every few years to see how, uh, just like that, Amani. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, okay, Josh. <laughs> ah, cheetahs are coloured to look like honey badgers. I did not know that, Jay. That's quite a cool fact. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Now, Abiy Ahmed uh, was made Prime Minister of Ethiopia in 2018. And, you know, I'm not particularly au fait on Ethiopian politics, but I've done a bit of research uh, to find out what kind of a guy this is. And it seems to be that the pr present current Prime Minister is pretty popular, not with everyone, but um, he seems to have made it his mission to bring peace to the country. Because there have been issues within Ethiopia. There's lots of different ethnic groups, so people who come from different backgrounds. There's lots of different um, religions, uh, Muslims, Christians being the main one, but also Jewish people and others. Um, and in recent years, Ethiopia hasn't had the best kind of relationship with some of its neighbours, um, especially the countries of Eritrea and Djibouti. Now, um, the prime minister, this current guy, he seems to have made it his mission to try and bring peace. So I've got some pictures of him here. Here he is with the leader of Djibouti, trying to make friends. There we go. Hello. Hello. Shall we not fight? Yeah, okay. Yay. There you go. Here we see him with the leader of Eritrea. No, they're, very, they're, they're, they're pretty serious. This is a pretty serious handshake. I don't know. They're supposed to be happy, though. Yeah, go with it. Um, he's also... Um... <laughs> That's all right, Kyle. Um, here we've got um, uh, the prime minister with the representative or a represent one of the one of the patriarchs of the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So the main group of Christianity in the country. There are quite a lot of flavors of Christianity, it has to be said. And in recent years, they have been arguing. But the current prime minister seems to have at least brought those arguments down, started to help the groups of different groups of Christians get on a bit better. So that's good. He d I think, and uh, Nad just says he looks bored, um, that yes, it looks like our patriarch is just about to fall asleep. I believe that they are in prayer. Uh, I don't think that they are, uh, that they're supposed to look bored. I think it's just an unfortunate photograph maybe. Um, <laughs> but you can see um, Jesus on the wall back there with the angels and his mother Mary. Uh, and the patriarch there has got his icon icons on his uh, around his neck and his great big cross. Um, uh, yeah, I, I like the style definitely. Um, <laughs> and here he is uh, with the Grand Mufti of Ethiopia. So that's uh, one of the highest ranking Muslim leaders in uh, the country too. Just to show that you know he is trying to bring religions together, trying to make it a really equal country for the different religions to to uh, live in. And to be fair, uh, the different religions of, uh, of Ethiopia have lived together in pretty much harmony. Uh, Mufti. Yeah, yeah, it's a brilliant word, isn't it? Yeah, the Grand, grand Mufti of Ethiopia, this guy is. Um, I'm not sure what the literal translation of Mufti is. Um, uh, but yes. Uh, oh, we'll come to the emperor in a bit, uh, Shadow Henchman. Mm, nice name. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the current prime minister, um, uh, I was looking at news stories for him and he has had a, a bit of a run in. He's very lucky to be prime minister because a few days after he was made prime minister in 2018, um, there was a great big uh, celebration for him being victorious. And 
into the crowd of people partying and celebrating, somebody threw a live hand grenade, which exploded, nearly killing the Prime Minister, but thankfully missed him. It did kill, I think, six other people and wounded a lot more. Um, uh, and so, yeah, that was a, a bit of a drama for sure. So not everyone was happy that he won the election. Um, so he does have enemies out there, but he survived that. And the first thing he did was went to the hospital to try and uh, uh, to visit all the people that had been hurt by the hand grenade that was meant for him. So, you know, not always peaceful uh, being prime minister, but you know, he survived that one. And uh, I saw the latest news story about him was that he's going to be staying a prime minister a little bit longer than normal because they have cancelled elections due to the virus in Ethiopia in the last couple of weeks. So that he's going to get he gets to keep his job for maybe a bit longer so that's cool yeah so yes he seems to be from what i've read and as i say i, I don't know the ins and outs of ethiopian party politics he seems to be quite a positive kind of guy um but maybe with some enemies uh, the real suspicious thing of course was that the hand grenade was thrown out of a police car Ooh, did somebody steal a police car or was it the police who tried to hand grenade him hmm, a mystery indeed okay so we'll leave uh, Abby Ahmed over there for now and we'll go and have a look at everyone's favourite part. It's the economy and development scale. Woo! Oh, yeah. So um, let's look down here. <laughs> yes, I've got one person wooing in the chat. Hooray. <laughs> Some people like it. All right. So we're going to compare here like we do every time. We're building this up over over the weeks uh, to try and see which are the richer countries and which are the poorer countries. Now, straight away, by looking at our graph of GDP per capita, if anyone can remember GDP per, per capita, um, we take all the money that a country makes from all the people working, doing all their jobs and all their businesses, and we shove it into a great big bucket. And then we divide that money out amongst all the people in the country, um, and that gives us the final figure of the average amount of money that each get. <laughs> Mia says this is the most boring bit. No way. Um, each person then gets an equal amount, and we work out how rich the country is on that scale. Um, it's not a perfect scale because, of course, in reality, the money of a country is not divided out equally amongst the people, but it does help us to understand. So, we can see so far, we've now got six countries on our scale here. We've got the UK, which is doing pretty well, uh, a rich country up here. We've got Australia and Denmark, who are quite a bit richer than us, though. So uh, they're getting more dollars uh, per person per year on average than they are in the UK. Then we've got our two emerging economies here, China and Brazil, two, con two economies which are getting richer, but they're starting from uh, a fairly... Uh, a fairly um, poor place and then right down the bottom unfortunately is Ethiopia Ethiopia coming in there at sixth place now just to compare the money because it doesn't look as extreme on this on this chart as it should do but in Ethiopia your average citizen makes 772.3 dollars a year whereas in England in Britain it's 42,920 dollars so more than 42,000 dollars more yeah, just let that sink in for a second. That means that the people of the UK are very, very well off compared to the people of Ethiopia. So that firmly puts Ethiopia in the bottom here. It's a very cultural country. It's got some amazing wildlife, but it's not very rich. Uh, you won't find the amount of businesses, factories, um, you know, expensive uh, shops and things uh, as you do in uh uh, other countries you know it's below it's right at the bottom so far uh, Bilal is asking why do we use US dollars now US dollars are used partly because we need to pick one currency and just work with that because um, if we're trying to measure all the countries of the world against each other we have to we have to choose what they have now someone's asking what is the currency of Ethiopia I have no idea I will have a quick search for you though um, uh, so what we do is we use US dollars just to make everything fair. If we started talking about pounds and dollars and then, I don't know, yen, it would get confusing. Um, and dollars is mainly because most of the data gathering and, you know, it has been agreed that the, the standard currency for our planet is dollars. That's the, uh, the main 
uh, currency that trading is done on the stock market. It's just the way it is, uh, I suppose, because a lot of these uh, economic functions were set up by America. So I, I imagine it's more history than anything else. Um, but let's have a look. What is the Ethiopian currency? Ooh. Let's have a look. So we have the Ethiopian Burr, B I double -R, R. That's our Ethiopian currency. Um, I'll just find you a picture of one. Here we go. So here's the Burr or a Burr note. I quite like the name of that. Here we are. So this is what money looks like in Ethiopia. Uh, the National Bank of Ethiopia, there it says. And here we've got. I don't know, some woman with a disc. It must mean something. I just don't know what. Um, uh, Rebecca, I'm afraid I, I, I don't know what you missed. So um, uh, you might have to watch the video back to see the missing bit. Sorry. Um, yes, we did have a look at the government. We had a look at the prime minister and then we had a look on, uh, then we went to the money. So yeah, that might help you. So um, because this is such a poor country or relatively poor country, there are poorer, don't get me wrong, uh, we might look at some poorer countries in the future. Um, uh, about 80% of the people in Ethiopia work in agriculture. They just grow food uh, and a lot of them make no money at all. Yeah, they have. Um, there are some nomads, I believe, Nadia, in Ethiopia. I don't think it's a massive thing, but I think there are nomadic groups uh, sort of around uh, uh, North Ethiopia, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're talking 80% of the people farming. We can see a cool picture here of Ethiopian farmers uh, picking crops. Now, uh, you can see there they're not using... There's no combine harvesters or anything. Yeah, this is a poor country. So people do most of their farming and agriculture by hand. We can see that these people, these women here, are gathering up leaves and putting them into baskets on their back, which they will then walk around with. So there you are. Uh, now I did find a particularly cool crop that is Ethiopian. Here we can see this amazing crop called Enset. Uh, Enset, as you can see, is absolutely huge. Um, apparently, after a little bit of research on this, uh, this plant is a relative of the banana tree, but it doesn't grow bananas. You just get these huge stalks and huge leaves, and they work kind of like they're, they're kind of like the camels of the plant world, which is good for the dry areas in the east of Ethiopia and in the south, because they store up loads of water in their great big. Uh, I, I'm going to say stalks, but they're more like trunks, aren't they? Um, they're almost trees, but not quite. Uh, so they store up loads of water and people can harvest these. And as you can tell, this is a, a full grown woman up against these massive plants. They will produce a lot of food for people. Maybe not the most exciting food, but yeah, no, it's edible. Yes, definitely. Yes. So uh, this will be often be grown in the south of the country in the warmer areas because it stores water. And it seems to be able to survive most conditions. Um, if if horrible droughts do come, dry periods with lots and lot with, with not enough rain, um, other crops like wheat, rice, they can be destroyed. Um, this stuff, Enset, seems to be able to survive most things. Um, so this is a very strong crop, crop in Ethiopia, but it's by no means the only crop that's grown there. Uh, more on that in a bit. She does look a bit grumpy, doesn't she? Yes, <laughs> she's like ah. How am I going to cut all this stuff down? Oh, there's too much of it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't think she is grumpy. Maybe she's just got the sun in her eyes. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> um, so yeah, pretty pretty amazing crop there. And uh, Ethiopia, about 80% of the people are farming. A lot of those people are not doing it for money. You know, They are what we call subsistence farmers, which means... If you imagine, instead of going to the shops and getting your food, uh, you just ate everything that you grew yourself. So you're a person, you have a little farm, maybe some animals, and you spend all your time looking after those crops, looking after your animals, and that's all you eat. You don't sell any of it. You don't get any food from anywhere else. You just farm to live. And so that's called subsistence. That means that those people make no money. It doesn't mean that they're like massively you know, living in terrible conditions although their conditions are going to be pretty basic um, but it does mean that these people uh, they have 
you know, they're not going to the shops and get or going to McDonald's or whatever. They're eating what they grow, and NSAID is a good thing for that. Okay, so let's go this way. Ooh, I've zoomed right out there. Look, here we go. Let's go and have a look at the culture. So we're going to start with this picture here. Now, there are many amazing ancient religious buildings in Ethiopia, but this is an example of one of my favorite. Um, this is a very special kind of church. Um, instead of building up, you know, you usually, to build a building, those of you who play Minecraft and stuff, um, you will build a building by stacking things up on top of the ground. In Ethiopia, they did it slightly differently. They've dug out this church from solid rock. So this would have all been one bit of rock at one point, and they've dug it down and dug it down, and they've carved out of the rock this church. Um, so yeah, maybe you Minecraft players out there, you could try and do something similar. Grab yourself a Minecraft world and see if you can build a house by digging out around it rather than uh, building your house on top of the ground. You know, this is what they're doing in Ethiopia. Uh, not anymore, these are very ancient, these churches. But inside a building like this, and you can see the worshippers all around, uh, you can go down, you can see people in the bottom there, and they've carved the church out itself to be a usable church. Um, I'm not sure where, where you get down. There is, there is like a, a staircase going, but I'm not sure. I think it comes out here. This might be the doorway. Maybe the stairs start back here somewhere, something like that. Or maybe it's a tunnel. Um, but inside, it's a, a normal building. It's just been built or I don't even know if you can say built, been carved out in an incredible way. Um, uh, oh, I see. It's, it's a, <laughs> um, uh, maybe it's a slide, says Jay. There could be a slide. I, I don't think there's a slide, but I like the idea. So, yes, there could well be. Maybe the back here, there's the start of a Helter Skelter, and you go right down the slide and then into the church. I quite like that idea, yes. I think it's maybe a bit more serious and sombre than that, because after all, this is a church. But there you go. Oh, so Rakea is asking, what's inside the cross? So the cross is the church. This is the building. It's a huge building. Um, so you would walk inside, and inside there's rooms with, you know, there's the, the main uh, area with the altar in it. Um, now, Ethiopia's claim to fame, or one of its claim to fame, is that it has some of the oldest copies of the Bible on the planet. Um, uh, some of them slightly different from the standard versions used by other Christians, for sure. So they have some very, very ancient texts which they look after in these churches. So, yes, incredibly valuable stuff inside these buildings. Uh, and people can go there and pray and you know, do their things, get married or baptized or whatever. Um, there you go. <laughs> How long did that take to build? I'm not sure, Henry. That's a good question. Um, I I'll have to do more research on it. I'm not sure. I know they're quite old, these buildings, but I don't know how old exactly when they were built. Um, we're talking you know, hundreds and hundreds of years old, but I'm not entirely sure when. Okay. Um, uh, why is someone hanging out of it? I'm not sure if anyone is hanging out of it. Uh, hmm. No, I, th I think everyone's inside, nice and safe. Yes. I mean, the benefit of carving it out of a solid block of stone, of course, is that you don't have to worry about like fitting the roof on and stuff because it's already built in. Yeah. Uh, no support beams either. Yeah. It's all just solid rock. Yeah. I mean, they've hollowed it out, of course, but yeah, should be pretty sturdy, shouldn't it? Yeah. I like it. So there, there are there are multiple of these in Ethiopia. This isn't the only one, but I, I like it as a as a very Ethiopian thing. You know, it's it's its own unique style. All right. Next, then, let's take a look. At the Emperor Haile Selassie. Now, from let's think. Hmm. If we talk to the Ethiopians, we're probably talking about four thousand years uh, since the time of King David uh, and King Solomon in the Old Testament to this guy here, Haile Selassie, who was the last emperor of Ethiopia. Um, he was the emperor up until the 1970s. How do you spell his name? Let me see if I can get this right. Ooh, let me go. Uh, uh, let me just uh, make sure I've got it and then I'll put it in for you. There we go. So. Haile Selassie, let's give him some capital letters there. That's a bit lazy, isn't it? So, Haile Selassie, the last emperor of Ethiopia. And he could trace his bloodline all the way back to King David. Well, that's the belief. So a Christian ruler of this country. Um, 
uh, Ethiopia's claim to fame is that except for a, a brief blip in the 1930s, Ethiopia was the only African country never to be taken over by Europeans. The rest of Africa was taken uh, between the well, 17th and uh, 19th centuries, Africa was divided up by European powers. Everyone took a bit of it. Um, you know, the British took a lot, the French took a lot, uh, even the Belgians took the Congo, uh, the Dutch took South Africa, um, the Italians took the North, Germany took some of West Africa, Portugal took Angola, uh, and the whole of Africa was eaten up, chewed up, by the Europeans who took over and decided that they would be in charge. The only exception being Ethiopia. Ethiopia kept its independence, it stayed strong. And uh, uh, you know, thank, uh, you know, partly due to luck, but partly due to strength and uh, determination. So we can give them credit there. Not that the rest of Africa was particularly in a position to fight back against the Europeans, but there you go. Um, but Haile Selassie then, he is the last of this long line of, of, of emperors. Now, uh, who's quite an eccentric man? Being the emperor will make you quite eccentric. Uh, there were basic rules about, you know, the kind of things emperors do. Um, bow when you see me, do not stand up, do not walk forwards in front of me, walk backwards. Um, he had his zoo, his menagerie, full of animals, including leopards and lions and tigers and all kinds. Um, uh, but mainly he walked around with a dog and the dog uh, was allowed to wee on the legs of anyone that it wanted to. Um, so Haile Selassie didn't just have a dog, he had a royal dog wee wiper. So the dog would come and it would wee on your leg, but you couldn't say anything or complain because otherwise you'd upset the emperor. But his little uh, uh, servant, the dog wee wiper, would come by and clean your shoes for you. You know, it was that kind of thing. So we can imagine this, this grand emperor in a great big palace doing all this stuff. But at the same time, even though he was quite eccentric like that, at the same time, he was a very forward thinking uh, leader as well. Um, now, unfortunately, let's see, where can we go? Uh, in the 1930s, the Italians invaded Ethiopia. Now, at this time, the Italian uh, empire led by Mussolini, empire, nation, hmm, uh, they had taken the neighbours of um, uh, Ethiopia. So they had uh, what was called Eastern Sudan back then, uh, what is now Eritrea and Djibouti. Those used to be owned by Italy. And the Italians wanted the rest. They wanted to take Ethiopia over as well. And so they started a war, a war which the Ethiopians couldn't really win. Um, we're talking, here's a picture of the Ethiopian army at this time. Uh, not particularly, remember, this is a poor country, so not particularly well armed. We've got guns. Um, but what the Ethiopians were up against were the Italian army with bombs from the sky. Hmm, can't really stop them with a gun. Uh, doesn't really work that way. Now, the emperor himself, Haile Selassie, he joined the fighting. He went to the front lines and he led his troops into battle against the Italians time and time again. But ultimately, uh, Ethiopia was taken over and Haile Selassie had to find somewhere to run away to. Now, if you are an African emperor, where are you going to go when things turn sour? Um, Haile Selassie came to England and he went and he stayed in a small town in the south called Bath. You may have heard of Bath, it might be near you. It's quite near Bristol. And he lived there for a few years. Um, here you can see him dressed up in his very English fashions, yes. So this is in Bath, I believe this picture was taken. Um, and he lived there for a while. He wasn't happy though, no. As much as he liked England, he did not like it as much as his own country. Mm. Um, uh, now, uh, Carl's asking, did they have a great war of the century? So this, yeah, it was, it was a big war for Ethiopia. This is just before World War II breaks out. And our next picture here shows another reason why I like Haile Selassie. Haile Selassie went to the old version of the, Le of, of the United Nations, where all the countries meet up. And he gave a grand speech. He was very good at speeches, was Haile Selassie. Um, now, here he is with his great big imperial cape on. Uh, he is dead now, yes. Black Lion, he is dead. Um, but he went to speak to the other countries of the world and he gave a very moving speech. He said, look, it Italy have attacked us. Now at the time, Italy was friends with Nazi Germany. And he said, if you let, he was talking to countries like Britain and France and America, if you let uh, Italy attack us and take my country from me, 
just you wait it'll be you next the Italians and the Germans will come for your countries and of course within a few years he was completely right because uh, France was taken down as was most of Europe uh, by the Nazi march of Hitler so he tried his hardest to fight back and eventually with a little bit of help he got his country back after World War II and he became emperor again hooray unfortunately this was not to last um, Throughout the 60s, he became quite obsessed with trying to make the country richer and more powerful. So he decided one of his grand schemes was to invite tourists to the country, to, you know, holiday makers to come on holiday in Ethiopia. And he put adverts out because, of course, aeroplanes were now a thing and you know, people did try to travel the globe. Um, but he decided that a good way to bring tourists in was to let them come and stay in his own house. So if you can imagine, in the 1960s, if you had enough money to go on holiday in Ethiopia, you would be met by the emperor himself, who would take you around his house and show you all his pets, his lions and his cheetahs, and then he would show you his bedroom. Seems like a strange thing, but there you go. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work for long, um, and very sadly, Haile Selassie was kicked out of power when the country decided to become a democracy, which isn't particularly sad. I mean, I do like Haile Selassie, but I think democracy might be better than having an emperor who goes around. Uh, well, we're not entirely sure what happened to him. He disappeared. He probably was killed. Um, uh, he wasn't given a very good burial, that's for sure. His body was kind of shoved out of the way but a few years later it was it was rediscovered um it'd been hidden under some stones his body and he was buried properly so yeah it was a sad end to a great emperor and there ends the four thousand years of the imperial line of ethiopia um but you know it was not necessarily a bad thing i mean it's probably bad what happened to heidi selassie but the people then they managed to have their own power they managed to vote and make the country the way they want to make it so there you go uh, that's Haile Selassie in a nutshell. Uh, there's a lot more that we could say about him. But let's go over here and have a look at the Eskita. Es Eskista? Eskista, I think. Now, the Eskista is a very special kind of Ethiopian dance. Uh, this dance is uh, the way it's been described to me. I've, I've seen it on YouTube. Um, so I do, uh, I do advise you to look up Eskista on YouTube and have a little dance along. But uh, the foundation of Esquista is a lot of movement with the shoulders and the upper body, lots of sort of wobbling and rambling and, you know, sh shimmying around with your top half, uh, lots of arm waving and stuff like that. So this is a special dance that they do in Ethiopia called Esquista. There you are. Um, <laughs> uh, are women allowed to vote in Ethiopia? I believe so, yes. I don't know if they've had a female prime minister, but I do believe women have the vote, yes. Um, Oh, Grace is asking, what happened to the animals? Um, that's a bit of a mystery. Uh, most people think they would have just been let go. I, I, the, the zoo isn't there anymore. Uh, Haile Selassie's palace is now like a museum. You can go in and look around and see what it was like. Um, but it's not used anymore by the government. The government have their own parliament buildings. Um, as far as I am aware, the animals just got set free. It was a bit chaotic during the time. You know, I've kind of said, you know, democracy took over it was you know one of these civil war type affairs so i don't know what happened to the animals i'm afraid unfortunately uh no do men dance too yes yeah i've got a picture here of some girls doing it or some women but yes men women children they all dance the esquista it's not just a, a female dance or anything like that for sure uh very you know a traditional ethiopian uh, way of celebrating things uh what languages do they speak that's a good question what is the main language of ethiopia hmm that is a good question I mean, we saw there that um, on their banknotes, they have English written, but I don't know what the... Ah, so um, Amharic is the official national language of Ethiopia, but also English, Arabic, Italian, and French are widely spoken. So there you go. Uh, so Amharic hmm, is what they tweak, which I think is that, uh, if we go back to our banknote here, I believe that that is the language that we saw at the top of the note. Let's see here. There we go. Ooh, oh no, I've made the whole thing go quite strange. Hmm. Here we are. No, yeah, we don't want that. So yes, I th believe that this is Amharic at the top here. This this written language here. Very old sort of flowing script. 
quite like it. Yes. But we can also see England or English written on there as well. How do you spell it? Mm, let me come back down here and I will write it in. Here we go. Uh, let's put that in here. Now, there we are. So that's the that's the main language, the official language of Ethiopia. There you are, hmm, learning. Um, now, Ethiopia also has another important cultural claim to fame. It's the, it's the first country in the world to have coffee. Coffee was discovered in Ethiopia. So all coffee in the, on the planet comes from the original discoveries um, in Ethiopia. Now, according to legend, and it is a bit of a legend, uh, you know, a, a rumor maybe, um, uh, the first coffee was found in Ethiopia and it wasn't used. It was fed to, to goats and things. It wasn't used by people because it stank too much. It was really, really smelly and no one liked it. Um, but over the years, people started to drink it. First of all, is in religious ways. Uh, we think it was probably Muslims who, who, who first started to drink it um, and use it in a religious ritual of some kind, although that's a bit hazy too. And then it started to spread uh, across Africa, and then it started to spread across the Middle East, where it became particularly popular, and then eventually it spread to Europe, where people got a taste for it too, especially when they discovered sugar, and they realized you could stop it tasting quite so much like goats by adding sugar and a bit of milk to it. There you go. So, um, but you can see here, here's a traditional uh, coffee grower. Uh, apparently this is Arabica coffee. I didn't know it was quite so red, but yeah, pretty cool. Um, uh, <laughs> there you go. So coffee, yeah, Ethiopia has given the world coffee, which is kind of important, I suppose. Um, and then we can also, this is, this links to the picture behind me out here, but Ethiopia accidentally created a religion, which you may have heard of, or you may have not, called Rastafarianism. Now, they never meant to create this religion. They didn't want to create this religion. But you'll see that the picture behind me represents Rastafarianism. Uh, I like it because of the lion. Um, but Rastafarianism is actually a religion that comes from Jamaica. Yeah, so it's not never started in Ethiopia. But what happened was a group of people who you know, were Christians, I suppose, um, they decided or they discovered or they realized, however you want to put it, they realized that... Uh, God was alive on earth and God was alive on earth in Ethiopia and God was alive on earth in the far form of Emperor Haile Selassie. He is God. Yeah. Um, now, uh, Emperor Haile Selassie's given name is Raz Tafari. Yeah, that's his proper name. You know, they call him Emperor Haile Selassie, but Raz Tafari is his proper name. So the people of Jamaica, or some people in Jamaica, they started a new religion called Rastafarianism. And part of that religion is to grow your hair into the famous dreadlock style. Just let it go into these, these cool dreadlocks. Here's a very famous Rastafarian, Bob Marley, uh, who's a musician, or was. Now, the Rastafarians of Jamaica, they spent years worshipping Rastafari, the emperor, really, you know, setting up you know pictures of him and praying to him and a lot of them spent a long time gathering up money so they could travel all the way from jamaica which is near america all the way to africa to go and meet the god on earth go and meet Haile selassie so they crossed the sea uh, this small group of rastafarians you know with their pictures of Haile selassie ready to worship him and to bow down to him because he is god and they get to the palace of Haile selassie and Haile Selassie tells them to go away. He says, I am not God. I'm a Christian. I don't believe in your weird new religion. Leave me alone. And he wouldn't even see them. He barred them from the palace. And the poor Rastafarians had to go back home to Jamaica. But they didn't give up. They still believe in that Rastafari is God on earth. Or at least now he is dead. God in heaven, I suppose. So... Yes, so Alex, Ethiopia and Jamaica have this really strong link uh, through this religious idea. Even though the Ethiopians, I don't believe they've taken on Rastafarianism. I don't think they really go with that. Um, but the people of Jamaica, they see Ethiopia as the roots of their religion because of, of, of the Emperor Haile Selassie. And they still worship him to this day. So, you know, Ethiopia didn't mean to create this religion, but they kind of ended up with it anyway. So there you go. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, uh, so there's a bit of a whistle-stop tour through Ethiopia. Um, hopefully you've learned some stuff today, guys. Um, I have. I didn't know that Amharic was the main language of Ethiopia, and I also didn't know what kind of money they used, so I feel like I've learned some stuff too. Um, uh, tomorrow we'll be looking at ancient Persia, um, and then on Friday we will be having some tales of the life of Zarathustra. So yeah, should be pretty good, I reckon. Um, Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you, hopefully, tomorrow.